Hello, everyone. Welcome again to the third in our China Insight uh, series. This one on unleashing urbanization and regional development in China. Our speaker again this time is Michael Enright, a Pierre Chouery Professor of Global Business at the Damon McKim School of Business and a faculty fellow of the Center for Emerging Markets. Uh, he will talk for about 40 minutes. As usual, please uh, type in your questions in the chat box. We should have some time in the end uh, for discussion. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, let me share my screen. And again, um, thanks to uh, Ravi and the, the Center for Emerging Markets at the Demora McKim uh, School for uh, hosting and sponsoring uh, this series. Um, as Ravi indicated, uh, tonight we'll focus on unleashing urban and regional development in China. And while it might seem like it's a sort of specialist topic for uh, regional economists, urban planners, it's really much more than that because a lot of China's overall economic and social development has really been uh, wound up in and wrapped up in its urban and regional development. Again, just uh, that's me. For those of you new to the, the series, uh, as Ravi uh, indicated, I joined uh, uh, the school in, in July. Um, but for purposes of this talk, what's more uh, interesting perhaps is that I've just uh, come back uh, to the US after spending 24 years on the ground, uh, mostly in China uh, during that period, doing work for firms, uh, governments, uh, and in fact, a lot of work on regional and urban development in China. Uh, here are some of the publications which you can look for on Google or Amazon, some of the range of things over the last 20 plus years. Um, but for purposes of tonight, when I went back through, I realized uh, that I've actually been uh, involved in literally dozens of projects on regional urban development all around China from the richest of the richest cities, uh, richest areas and the richest cities in China to some of the poorest areas and the poorest cities and poorest provinces uh, in China. So uh, again, lots of work all over the place. We can come back to that if uh, people are interested in it later. Um, to start with, when China began its reform and opening process, 1979, 1980, um, roughly 81% of its population was in the rural sector. Basically, only about 19% of China's population uh, was in the cities uh, at that time. And 40% of GDP was in the primary uh, sector and 81% of employment. So China was still basically in many ways an agrarian uh, society. Few cities had identifiable commercial or financial districts. Um, provinces, cities, districts within cities, and even individual work units were designed to a first approximation to be self-sufficient. And what that meant was that um, cities in China, if you parachuted into uh, a city in China, it almost didn't matter where you landed because it all looked the same. Uh, and there were uh, substantial barriers to trade and investment between cities and provinces, uh, and intra and intercity infrastructure uh, was severely limited. I mean, back in those days, it could take eight hours to get from Shenzhen uh, to uh, Guangzhou, which is only about 100 uh, kilometers away. And one of the major stories of China's economic emergence has been the unleashing of urban and regional development. This has involved urbanization and urban planning, massive intra and intercity infrastructure development, the creation of differentiated areas within cities, identifiable financial districts, identifiable uh, high rise central business districts, identifiable industrial suburbs. Again, it all used to look the same in the pre-reform uh, period. In addition, uh, an increasing development of a division of labor across cities as much more of the economy became more market oriented. 
the opening of intercity and interprovincial markets, uh, breaking down of many of those barriers to trade and investment uh, between cities and provinces, which went on for decades actually uh, after uh, the reform process started. And then moves more recently towards integrated regional development, which I'll go through in some detail towards the, uh, the end of the talk. And then finally, like many aspects of China's development, uh, its urban and regional development and its magnitude and importance is perhaps unprecedented. Uh, and like many things about China, one of the reasons why we're doing this series, um, not well understood outside of China uh, as well. Okay, first, what do we mean by cities? And cities can mean different things in different countries. For example, China's cities are large by international standards. The jurisdiction of Shanghai is 6,341 square kilometers. Beijing is over 16,000 square kilometers. Chengdu, 14,380. And then Chongqing, which is called a municipality, is actually more like a small province uh, than it is a large city. And a kilometer is six tenths of a mile for those of us who uh, tend to think in English uh, measures. And in comparison, Boston city proper is 232 square kilometers, New York 784. So in China, when you're talking about the municipality level, you're generally talking about a core city, you're talking about the suburbs, and in many cases, you're also talking about a significant rural area, which is inside the jurisdiction of the city. So a lot of the city statistics include all three of these types of areas. Although again, at the city level, they do uh, compile statistics for the urban areas versus uh, the rural areas. But the first thing to get into uh, our heads is the notion of a city in China, that level of jurisdiction, the area over which the Shanghai mayor is mayor is much, much larger than we're used to thinking of in, uh, in the US, Western Europe and most other countries. Then in addition, there are four cities, municipalities that have provincial level status. Those are Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, uh, and Chongqing, where the, uh, the, the line of uh, the, the org structure, as it were, goes central government to the provinces, but those four cities have the same status as provinces. And in addition, when one talks about regional development in China, um, China tends to define itself into four major economic regions. And the boundaries of some of these regions have um, shifted over time. But for policy purposes, currently, uh, this is sort of the four region breakdown. Uh, the East, that's the cities most of us would be familiar with, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, et cetera, the coastal areas. Then the Northeast was the uh, traditional coal and rust belt uh, area, industrialized uh, Northeast. Uh, that again had an industrial past, but current challenges. Then the West um, included what was called the third line. Uh, after the founding of the PRC, uh, Mao Zedong decided to move a substantial portion of heavy uh, industry away from the coast in order for it to be safe in case of attack and put it not in the middle provinces, but provinces uh, further West. Uh, and of course, uh, when you take into account the entire West, you're talking about high plateaus and desert uh, out to the extreme West and a number of, of uh, geological uh, challenges out there. Uh, then in the center, uh, the, the blue area on the slide, um, actually this traditionally was the poorest part of China because a significant uh, portion of the industrial base had been shifted inland the coast was where uh, a lot of the economic development had always taken place historically. And it was that center which was more or less neglected uh, for, for many years. And that actually became the poorest part uh, of China. Uh, traditionally sort of passed over between East and West. So again, just so we get in our mind sort of literally the lay of the land. 
And uh, one of the challenges China has always faced and continues to face is a series of disparities, disparities between uh, the income levels and affluence of urban households versus rural households, but also disparities between uh, those main regions. So as we can see, the Eastern coastal region has uh, always had substantially higher uh, income levels for both the urban uh, and rural households than the central, uh, western, and uh, northeastern. And this is still uh, an issue or a set of issues uh, that China grapples with. Urbanization rates, I mentioned before that when China started its opening uh, process, 79.80, there were approximately 19% of uh, China's population in the uh, urban setting. By 2019, that was 61%. So in terms of urbanization, China has gone from where India was and is now rapidly approaching EU levels of urbanization. Uh, of course, behind the US and behind Japan. And when we try to think of the magnitude of what that means, it's uh, between, it's, it's nearly 655 million people. Um, again, the population wasn't quite as large, but the number of urban residents is uh, again, on the order of 650 million more than it was in 1980. There are only two countries in the world with a population of over 600 million, right? China and India, and the third largest population is actually the US with about 330 million. So roughly twice the population of the US um, wasn't in cities in China in 1980 and is in cities uh, today. Now from an economist standpoint or a business leader's standpoint, urbanization does many things. One thing that it does, particularly in the developing world, is it allows people to be reached uh, as consumers and also as producers. And urbanization in China has not only moved people from the rural sector to the urban sector, it has made them accessible as consumers and accessible as producers. It has drawn them into the service and manufacturing uh, economy. And so the shift in the relative proportions of the economy in primary versus manufacturing versus services has uh, also trended with the shift in population. And again, because its urbanization rate is so much higher than India's, uh, China has by far the most cities in the world with populations over 1 million and 5 million. It has 102 at the last count, cities uh, with population over a million, has 19 over 5 million. And what does this mean? Well, if you combine it with the rapid pace of change of development and redevelopment, it's basically made China into the world's laboratory for urban planning, for urban design, for architecture and related fields. Uh, so a lot of the cutting edge work in all of those fields is going on in China and has been going on in China for quite some time. But it also means that the challenges of managing large scale cities are also uniquely felt in China, just given the number of cities and the magnitude of uh, the number of urban dwellers. Again, in very broad brush, so forgive me uh, those who know this already, I'm gonna be very broad brush. If we think of the period between 1949 and 1979, basically urbanization to the extent it occurred, occurred largely to promote industrialization uh, that was set forth in the five-year plans of the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the PRC uh, government. The, the hukou, the residence permit, uh, placed control on population. And through this period, it was very difficult, if not impossible, to shift from, becoming a, from being a rural resident to an urban resident. So literally where you were born uh, dictated your life. 
All cities and districts were designed to be self-sufficient, as I mentioned before. I also mentioned that third line development. And for those of you familiar with Star Trek, the next generation, the Borg ship, where if you landed there, it looked the same everywhere. That was like the cities in China, as I said before. If you parachuted in, it almost didn't matter where you landed because it all looked the same, undifferentiated city structures. Then as the reform process started and then proceeded, we saw reform-based urbanization. We saw the development of export-oriented production near the coast and the industrial zones uh, that, uh, that supported that. We saw urban centers uh, start developing so that China could interact with the rest of the world. When you start interacting with the rest of the world through information flows, transportation flows, it's almost invariably going through major gateway cities. And so the infrastructure had to be built to support the trade, the investment, the communication, and the starting of the differentiated areas. We started to see real financial districts, real central business districts with the high rises where the high end face-to-face -face services uh, take place as distinguished from manufacturing suburbs and uh, the rural uh, outside. And then of course, as uh, China started to industrialize, uh, one needed to provide the housing and the transportation systems and the urban services that were uh, required for these uh, growing cities. 1988 to 2000, a massive land reform uh, took place. China started uh, to finance its development through the, uh, the sale of land use rights and property rights over, over property uh, started uh, becoming uh, the norm. And cities in particular uh, started uh, funding large portions of their uh, municipal budgets uh, by selling land. And as a result, they uh, were very aggressive in converting uh, rural land to urban land because then you could sell it to build industrial parks or residential developments and then use that to fund uh, the city's development and its social uh, service uh, requirements. And over this period of time, as China started uh, to, to grow rapidly, its economy started to grow rapidly, we started seeing the, city, the cities leave the countryside behind in terms of economic development, uh, levels of affluence, uh, et cetera. And the disparities uh, continued to expand. Then uh, starting around 2000, the central government decided that it really needed uh, to uh, gain much, much tighter control over the urbanization process. It couldn't just allow uh, the cities to develop sort of uh, willy nilly. Um, also, uh, central government pushed to try to even out the development between the coastal east and the other regions of the, econ of the country. And one way of doing that was to promote urbanization in first the capital cities and then uh, secondary cities in all of the provinces. So the idea there being build real cities, differentiated urban structures, first in the provincial capitals, which historically, of course, had been the nodes for decision making and also communication, et cetera, with the rest of the country and start to do this uh, in a more systematic, uh, a more planned way in order to support the economic development of the surrounding uh, provinces. Uh, the notion of integrated urban rural development. Uh, Chongqing was the initial test case. And in fact, uh, our firm was involved in that in the, the early days. The notion of how to develop the cities in order to bring the countryside along, in order to have the urban uh, centers not just self-contained, but highly interactive uh, as a place to uh, to uh, provide from which to provide urban services uh, to work with uh, the local uh, economies. There was an attempt to push for more balanced development of cities and towns, um, marginally successful, because the 
underlying economics indicated that it was the large cities that got larger, the more affluent cities got more affluent. They then had the resources to do more advanced infrastructure, uh, which supported denser urbanization, which supported high level and high value added person to person services, which contributed more to the affluences, which gave them more resources to develop, which attracted more people in a virtuous cycle, uh, at least until some of the cities got, got very, very large. And also central government uh, stepped in to halt the conversion of uh, agricultural, uh, rural land, agricultural land uh, to urban land, trying to limit uh, the spread of the cities in, uh, in a more controlled manner. And then over the last 10 years or so, and again, highly simplified, we've seen a series of new urban development guides that have taken a, a much deeper look of what goes on inside the cities and trying to influence and control that. Denser street networks, enforcing the boundaries, expanding mixed use, workplace, residential, retail uh, development, uh, transportation, again, a, a series of things that we'll, we'll come back to a bit later. So there have been a series of stages in terms of urban development. In terms of broader regional development, um, when China started to open, it did so sequentially. It did so one bit of geography at a time. It started with four special economic zones uh, in Southern China, then 14 coastal cities were open to trade and investment, then the entire coast, then the rest of the country. And in terms of the regional focus of development, originally it was the Pearl River Delta area of Guangdong province adjacent to Hong Kong uh, and Macau and parts of Fujian uh, adjacent to or facing Taiwan. And then in the early 1990s, the attention shifted to opening up the Yangtze River Delta around uh, Shanghai. And then the West Northeast Central, try to get them to catch up. And then um, over the last uh, five, six years, uh, regions that are linked to the Belt and Road Initiative that we discussed uh, in our February uh, session, uh, far Western China, um, Southwestern China have become uh, targets of development. And then more recently, and we'll come back to this later, there's actually been a re-emphasis back on the coastal regions. Because now one of the major thrusts is not just developing uh, China and Chinese cities to be better than they are. Uh, the more recent focus is to try to make them world-class, interacting with other world cities and world leading economies. And that's taking place primarily through the first tier cities uh, along the coast. And then in terms of inside cities, as China started to industrialize, it did so in industrial zones within cities, then again, differentiated internal development. And one of the more recent thrusts is now transportation oriented development, taking a page out of the Hong Kong playbook and selling the land use rights around metro stations to finance the metro and the other transportation. Uh, so in a self uh, self-feeding way, self-reinforcing way. And then over the last several years, there's also been a push to try to link uh, cities together into city regions and to create an additional division of labor and sharing of resources at the regional level across city clusters. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. How has this all been funded? Well, in the old days pre-reform, most locations uh, funded themselves through the local versions of state enterprises. Then as we saw more reforms and land reforms started to happen, uh, we saw a shift to land sales. Now uh, it's more locally obtained taxes, uh, local government financial vehicles, and uh, decentralized borrowing, the development, uh, the incipient uh, development anyway of an urban bond market uh, is happening. Now, 
In terms of what some of these urban infrastructure investments have been, I'll just take an example uh, of metro systems. In 1990, Hong Kong had a metro subway system uh, for, for those who speak American rather than English. Um, and also in Tianjin and Beijing, there were one or two lines. That was 1990. By 2020, you can see dozens of cities in China had metro systems. And China had gone from nearly zero in 1990 to well over 4,000 kilometers of metro track, which is by far the largest in the world. So China went from nowhere uh, to world leader in less than 30 years. China now has, uh, what, three times, uh, roughly three times, little under three times the number of subway uh, track kilometers as the United States and of course dwarfs everybody else. And while New York has more stations than any other subway system in the world, uh, the Shanghai and Beijing uh, systems have uh, the longest, are the longest in terms of uh, kilometers. And these are still being built out where New York is really not building new subway lines uh, these days. So that's just urban and here's just maps of the Shanghai and the Beijing systems. And when I first went to Shanghai in the early 90s, there was nothing. So this has all been done from nothing again in less than, less than 30 years. And if we remember those of us who now live in Boston, if we remember the big dig, right? Which is just a couple of kilometers of road and bridge took 15 years, right? 15 years, China could build, you know, 2,500 kilometers of metro system. If we look at the high, uh, this is high-speed rail. Again, 2008, a couple of kilometers here and there, but to a first approximation, not a whole lot. From virtually zero uh, to uh, accounting for roughly two-thirds of the world's high-speed rail uh, kilometers in existence today, with plans to nearly double this. So again, in 10 years, China went from virtually nowhere to having uh, a high-speed rail system that's 10 times the size of any other country, right? We have to sort of, again, get this in our heads, what an ach achievement this is, and think about what it would take to build 20 or 200 kilometers of high-speed rail in the United States and China's done, you know, 35, 36,000 in a little over a decade. In terms of the National Expressway system, China now by, is by far uh, the largest in terms of expressway kilometers or miles. Uh, it's about 50% larger than the United States in terms of expressway miles. Uh, although the, the land masses are actually quite similar in size, US and China. The US does have a denser road network uh, than China does. In part, that's because of the far west where there just aren't many people uh, in China, but even there, China is, is catching up rapidly. And again, China went from not many expressway miles to being easily the world's largest system in about 20 years, 20, 25 years. And then in terms of airports, China now has 65 international airports, which is uh, far behind the US. And the US has many, many uh, small private airports. So that's why the US numbers are so big. But in terms of building large airports, uh, China's, what China's done again over the last 20 years has been virtually unprecedented. And all of these additions to the infrastructure connect. They connect within cities, they connect cities to their surroundings, they connect cities to other cities. And all of these connections facilitate communication, uh, can, uh, facilitate trade, facilitate economic activity. So you can't talk about China's economic development without talking about its infrastructure and urban development. And today we see uh, in leading Chinese cities, these gleaming skyscrapers, be it Beijing or Shanghai or Guangzhou or Shenzhen or Tianjin or Chongqing, or uh, we got down here is Wuhan, here's Chengdu. So this must be Nanjing. 
Um, and major Chinese cities have some of the world's most modern districts. But they also have older areas in dire need of redevelopment. And this creates social and public health issues. For example, roughly eight months before the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, or at least the widespread outbreak in, in Wuhan, we had done a project on urban development in Wuhan, and we were urging the then mayor and party secretary to thin out some of the older districts where the buildings were right next to each other with poor ventilation, uh, poor sanitation, because we said this is ecologically a disaster, it's economically inefficient, and it's a public health hazard. And sure enough, that was the sort of local uh, urban topography that promoted uh, the initial stages of the, the spread of the COVID virus uh, in Wuhan. So these issues are not just economic issues, they're social issues, they're public health uh, issues as well. More recently, China has focused on trying to link cities together into a series of city clusters. There were 22 of them identified in the 13th five-year program, which basically is gonna be replaced very soon by the 14th five-year program, which we will talk about in our April uh, session. And uh, in particular, the three leading coastal clusters, uh, the what they call the Jing Jin Ji cluster, including Beijing, Tianjin, and the areas immediately surrounding, the Yangtze River Delta cluster with Shanghai and the cities surrounding, and the Pearl River Delta, or they're now calling Greater Bay Area. Uh, increasingly, uh, the focus is to really build up these city clusters and then make them a demonstration uh, zones for the rest of China. And these three main agglomerations account for 36% of GDP while occupying only 2.8% of China's land area, house 18% of China's population. Again, so if you just do the simple division, you can see that the disparities in China are still very much there. And it is very definitely three major uh, urban clusters that drive much of China's growth and development. Why try to link these cities together into clusters and create more regional integration? Uh, one reason is to overcome obstacles the obstacles of fragmented markets. If you defragment, if you unify, organize the markets, it's much more efficient to serve them. It's also to try to reduce the historic competition between cities. It's trying to reduce the over-concentration and overpopulation, according to Chinese officials, of the key first tier cities like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou. And also it's an attempt to spread uh, development from those lead cities to the surrounding countryside. But also it's a matter of trying to create advantages. If you have large integrated regional clusters of cities that allows you to have a division of labor. It allows you to specialize. It allows you to increase the overall urban carrying capacity by allocating each activity or each industry around the region, link it all together in a much more efficient way. It allows for labor market pooling, right? Uh, once you're integrated with transportation, you can commute to another city if the high-speed rail takes you under an hour to get there, right? Uh, so it allows much more connectivity and allows these urban centers to interact with each other and with their hinterlands. Now, one of the hallmarks or several of the hallmarks are that these city cluster regional integration programs are made by the central government and they're administered locally. So the central government makes the policies in fact, there is a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo who has direct oversight on all of these regional cluster programs. The local governments are supposed to cooperate with each other, implement the policies, report to the center, but they're not the decision makers. And because within the Politburo itself, 
are the party secretaries of many of the major cities like Shanghai, the provincial governor of Guangdong, uh, the mayor of uh, the, rather the party secretary of Beijing and Tianjin, they're all in the Politburo. So they're all making uh, decisions that then they go and implement locally. And this sort of centralized planning and then uh, implementation at the local level is very much an example of the new centralism that's developed under Xi Jinping that we discussed in our first uh, session back in, uh, back in January. Each of these city clusters is unique. The Yangtze River Delta cluster is over 200,000 square kilometers. The Greater Bay Area cluster is just over 56,000 square kilometers. Population 154 million, population 73, GDP 20, GDP 11. So we can see that these clusters uh, vary uh, greatly. The Yangtze River Delta one is the largest. The Greater Bay Area is one of the larger. There are other smaller clusters, but again, they all differ. They all have their own character. Now, one of the things about putting these city clusters together is what I call the physics of city clusters. And that just has to do with the travel times and what you can do at different distances. For example, a one hour travel time is a commuting distance. Uh, I mean, my father used to commute an hour from Long Island into Queens in, in New York City uh, every day. Actually, it used to take him closer to two hours um, but one hour is a relatively straightforward commute. It allows for daily interaction uh, between people, between organizations. Two hours is maybe multiple interactions per week. If your customer is two hours away, it's not a hardship to go and visit them. You can visit them a number of times a week. Three hours at a three hour travel distance, there you can have a warehouse that serves a three hour radius. You can have high end professional services where it's not being on the train or in the car every week, but you know, once a month, twice a month. Yeah, three hours you can do that. And then five to seven hours is efficient supply chains. It's basically one round trip on a truck for a, a, a 10 to 14 hour day that many, many truckers do. And so you can think of different levels of economic interaction that take place once you connect uh, places with uh, these various uh, travel times. And basically, again, I'm gonna oversimplify, but urban planners and urban economists tend to think of three hours as the critical number that essentially economic development anywhere within a three hour radius helps economic development everywhere else within that three hour radius, okay? Uh, that's a rough, rough rule of thumb. And what the improving connections, as I said, economic interaction, division of labor, large efficiency gains as a result, and also greater innovation. Because studies of the innovation process show that it's really the interaction of people that creates innovation. So again, you broaden the scope, you broaden the number of people that can interact with each other, you tend to get more innovation. So the largest, this Yangtze River Delta, the cluster plan there includes 26 cities, Shanghai, nine cities in Jiangsu province, eight in Zhejiang, eight in Anhui. Uh, and this accounts for roughly 20% of China's total uh, GDP. And there was an outline plan uh, published in 2018 that guides that development. And what's interesting is how that plan was framed. It was framed as, and this is a direct quote, the only way to accelerate the formation of new competitive advantages in international competition. That within China, it was necessary to now organize resources at a regional level at 150 million people rather than the 23, 24 million people uh, in Shanghai in order to get the interaction that would foster the right innovation process, the right division of labor to push the economy forward. And 
that the city cluster is going to be the engine for this type of development. And it's the optimization of this cluster that is going to drive the economy forward. And then within each of the cities, there's also a very clear plan to try to improve urbanization. It's not just development at all costs, but rather it's uh, more human uh, development as well. So there are spatial components, there are economic development components. I won't go into the details, but I just want to show you that these are incredibly detailed plans with specific city nodes assigned particular roles, particular transportation networks uh, planned and put in place. Now, Shanghai, of course, is the highlight. And Shanghai has not only a regional role, but it also has a national role for China. And basically, Shanghai is supposed to become uh, China's global city. It's supposed to be the city that will stand up uh, against New York and London and Paris uh, and Tokyo, an innovation center with global influence by 2020. By 2035, it's supposed to start hitting um, global world-class standards uh, across a wide variety of uh, performance indicators. And by 2050, the goal is for Shanghai to be the leading global city. Very ambitious, detailed plan, which goes to 2050. How many US cities have detailed plans which they actually might execute that will take them from 2020 to 2050? I think the answer is not that many. And again, the steps include addressing urban dynamism, making the city more attractive, making it more sustainable. And development within the Yangtze River Delta, I liken to the sort of champagne uh, pyramid because Shanghai is the major attraction. And if Shanghai were left unconstrained, a lot of this economic activity would happen within Shanghai. But because Shanghai's population has gotten so large and Shanghai is becoming more difficult to manage as a result, central government is sort of putting a cap on population. Once that happens, or it's already happening, what's starting to uh, result is economic activities spilling over to the other cities in the Yangtze River Delta. So basically, as the Shanghai glass gets full, activities spill over to Nanjing and Hangzhou, and then to Ningbo and the other cities uh, in the region. And so how Shanghai develops is really critical uh, for the rest of that region. Now, in the interest of time, I will skip uh, the uh, analysis of the Greater Bay Area, the other major uh, cluster. If you Google my name and GBA, you'll see a document that, uh, that comes up, a study that we did and put in the public domain a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the region that includes Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. And what I want to do, again, in the interest of time, is just skip down, again, each of the cities has been assigned a role in terms of the local division of labor. And here I just want to highlight Shenzhen. Because just as Shanghai has a key economic role in the Yangtze River Delta, it's really Shenzhen which has been given the key role in the GBA. And that role is to be uh, China's Silicon Valley. Shenzhen is already the home of Huawei, ZTE, Tencent, DJI, and it really is the high-tech uh, startup center uh, for China. And it's a combination of the skills and capabilities in China, plus the access to information and capital from the rest of the world through Hong Kong that have uh, focused uh, on Shenzhen. And Shenzhen uh, had uh, 260,000 people in 1980. By this year, the official population is 12.6 million, but um, people in the, uh, the government in Shenzhen told me recently there are actually about 20 million people uh, living in Shenzhen. So 260,000 to 20 million, again, in, uh, in this case, 40 years, right? Big change. So there are plans, and there are plans for everything. All of the land use, that's planned. 
the 19 new industrial parks, which are supposed to be the vanguard of China's high tech push, those are under construction. We have uh, transportation networks. The metro system in, in Shenzhen is going to be tripled over the next 10 years. It's going to become, uh, again, 600, 800 uh, kilometers. Uh, Shenzhen is supposed to be a modern, international, innovative city by 2025. It's already well on its way. It's supposed to be a benchmark city for the rest of China by 2035. And again, uh, sorry, um, this should be 2050. And by 2050, it's supposed to be a benchmark for the rest of the world. So just as Shanghai is supposed to lead Yangtze River uh, Delta development in many ways, it's Shenzhen, not Guangzhou, uh, the capital, the provincial capital of Guangdong that is assigned a similar role in the, uh, in the GBA area. Uh, and again, I will skip this in the interest of time. And I'll just uh, go to our conclusions. And that is one of the major contributors to China's rise has been this unleashing of urban and regional development. It is not just something for urban planners and regional economists uh, to be interested in because it is part and parcel of China's overall economic and social development. China's evolved from an economically undifferentiated and unconnected series of provinces, cities, and districts to now highly differentiated cities, districts, provinces connected with modern communication and transportation. China's benefited from integrated planning, massive infrastructure investments, training of local officials, learning from the rest of the world, and a number of policy shifts along the way. And the scale and the speed, uh, hopefully you will have seen, has made China the world's laboratory for virtually anything having to do with urban development and design. There are many challenges that remain, including the disparities, urban, rural, east versus west of country, the overpopulated tier one cities, poverty alleviation in the poorer cities, and the public health and social uh, service delivery, particularly in some of the poorer cities. Still major, major challenges. And China's urban and rural development, again, it's not just important in economic terms, it's also important in many, many other terms and many, many other dimensions we might not have understood even two, two and a half years ago. And while there have been major uh, and many twists and turns along the way, the regional and urban development in China is an enormous accomplishment. Have there been problems? Absolutely, there continue to be problems. But when you look at what's been achieved, it really is uh, extraordinary. And again, now living in a country where it took 15 years to do a few kilometers of, you know, of highway construction and bridge, when I go to China and I see areas that I help design go from a couple of hundred thousand people to well over a million people and become, for example, the third central business district of Shanghai, it's hard not to be impressed. I'll just remind uh, you of uh, our next scheduled sessions, April 14th on the 14th five-year program, May 12th on the challenge for Chinese companies going public in the US. And with that, I will end my remarks and thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have time for a few questions, I think. Uh, let me start with the first one. Here's a question. It says, what came first? Industrialization or urbanization? To a first approximation, industrialization. Because what happened first, uh, if we talk about during the reform period, again, moving from where China was till today, the initial industrialization took place in the special economic zones, uh, in Shenzhen, uh, Zhuhai, uh, Shantou, and then around uh, Shanghai and places like Suzhou and Wuxi. And as long as it was purely for export and the largest portion was sourced by foreign companies, you didn't need to have the cities develop. But basically you had the industrialization create the need for the development of modern cities. And then uh, the urban development uh, wound up with its own self-reinforcing dynamic. Okay, um, uh, this is a question that I, I wanted to ask you myself, and that is, 
what countries or which models inspired the Chinese approach to urbanization? I know the Chinese have always tried to learn from other countries, uh, the policymakers have, but in totality, you don't see anything like this in any other country. So I'm wondering if at this point, they are charting their own course and really offering lessons for the rest of the world. Well, what's very interesting, it's been a really interesting combination. What China has done, and, and to its credit, is it has brought world experts from everywhere into China. And if you take the world's best minds and you focus them on the challenges, people will recognize, well, what's a challenge that's been solved elsewhere? And they'll also recognize what challenges haven't been solved elsewhere. But if you think about it, and again, I've been directly involved in advising at this point two dozen uh, Chinese cities and or private sector developers working with government to develop these cities. And we know what a city say of 7 million people looks like if we look like at New York City, if we look at London. Yeah. And so when Shanghai started to urbanize, Shanghai today is basically like three cities of 7 million people. And that's really how it's organized around three different central business districts, mm -hmm. clear division of labor. So there were enough examples of what was going on, combine that with bringing the world's uh, expertise to China to solve new problems, that's been the combination. So really today, I mean, if you're an architect and you're not you know, working in China, you're not working on the world's most interesting problems. If you're an urban planner and you're not working on urban planning in China, you're not working on the world's most interesting problems. So the world's expertise is largely in China these days, or travels back and forth quite frequently. Hmm. Uh, this leads to a question from uh, one, of, one of the members of the audience, and that is, and uh, ties directly into what you just said, uh, China has learned from the rest of the world. Can the rest of the world, or is the rest of the world learning from China, specifically the US? And this person wants to know, can the US, what can the US learn from China uh, as it tries to upgrade its own infrastructure? And I know that the Biden administration is talking of maybe a big push in that direction. Is that anything the U.S. can learn uh, from China? Well, the first thing that the U.S. should learn from China is what's possible, right? Because the U.S. is still a much larger economy than China. We have more money. Question is, what do we do with it? Um, so China has been able to invest China's been able to create economic opportunity. Um, I mean, when I moved back from being based in Asia for 24 years back to the Boston areas, there are potholes that I recognized from 25 years ago that are still there. Um, we seem to be incapable of organizing, financing, and executing at nearly the speed that China does. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that there are particular types of development that, for example, are environmentally much more sensitive. U.S., we tend to have uh, quite spread out cities and suburbs. China, in part because, you know, a smaller portion of the population has cars, and in part because there are so many more people, they're doing much denser development. Mm. And that is actually more efficient in terms of delivery of public health uh, services, um, in terms of uh, environmental considerations, many environmental considerations, uh, et cetera. So we need to learn um, basically what's possible. We need to learn it doesn't take 50 years to build an airport. Uh, we need to understand it doesn't take 15 years to do a couple of kilometers of, of highway that this is all possible, but there has to be the will to do it. And we need to have elements of our society to cooperate. Again, it's not, I won't say China has an advantage because it's not a democracy. I say there are some things it can do more efficiently because people are brought into line. If we're going to match that, we have to around basic issues like you know 
Don't we deserve good airports? Don't we deserve good subway systems? Don't we deserve uh, the type of infrastructure that connects um, the less affluent to the more affluent areas to create jobs uh, for the less fortunate? Um, those are things that we can learn. Mm. Uh, would you say a little bit about the hookah system that you touched on and how is that being modernized? Because that, as you said, limited the mobility of people, but there's actually been a lot of movement of people from uh, the, the rural areas to the urban areas uh, and particularly to the big cities. How is that process being managed and how is it being reformed uh, to, okay. to adjust to the changing times? Okay, so pre-reform, uh, as I said before, you know, where you were born is where you roughly stay. With the reform process, and particularly as some of the coastal areas started industrializing, creating, of course, a huge need for urban workforce, uh, the hookah restrictions were informally relaxed. So you had a situation where you had well over 100 migrant workers who officially weren't supposed to be living where they were living, but everybody looked the other way because it's what drove the economy. But those workers were not eligible to receive social services in their new location. So that created you know, a, a situation where many of the factory workers simply weren't eligible for local services because they didn't have the, the hookah. If we fast forward gradually over time, we've seen the people who are working in a place have that status regularized. What we're now seeing is within these uh, urban clusters, these city clusters, that if you have the right to live anywhere within the urban cluster, you can live almost anywhere within the urban cluster. Mm -hmm. So in the Yangtze River Delta, uh, as long as you don't want to move to Shanghai, that's still tightly controlled, you can virtually live anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So those restrictions are being eased. They're not completely gone, um, but they've been eased as the economy required it and as uh, the central government felt it could manage it. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you speak to some of the, the human cost of some of this development? Because I know that large numbers of people were relocated. Sometimes uh, properties were seized. Uh, and, you know, the, and that's part of how China is able to move this, uh, this fast. Uh, but would you speak to that side of it? Now, we know that that's the cost of getting this kind of fast development. But give us a sense of what that cost uh, might have been. Okay. Well, first off, in terms of quote-unquote ownership, uh, China is a socialistic country. So private property was not enshrined in the constitution until I believe was 1993, 1994. Mm -hmm. So there really wasn't legally in China the concept of private property before that. Mm -hmm. There obviously was, uh, was you know, historical precedent and, and where people lived, et cetera. And in the early days of urbanization, um, basically local uh, communities were, were just literally bulldozed. Um, and that really changed over time. By the early 2000s, you were actually seeing pretty reasonable levels of compensation uh, be given. Because the way the economics worked out is that cities were given permission to redevelop when the act of redevelopment created enough economic value to relocate the pre-existing residents, create the infrastructure and the public utilities, and to give uh, the investors in the uh, redeveloped uh, area uh, an investment that had a chance of appreciating. Mm. So China controlled the pace of redevelopment and basically ran the numbers on which places would uh, would um, you know would be able to foster that? Uh, now, were there abuses in the early days? Absolutely. Are there still? Uh, I'm sure there there are, uh, but it's become much more of uh, an eminent domain type situation that we might recognize in in the West, at least over the the last uh, several years. Hmm. Now, other costs as well. Again, it, did it disrupt communities? Yes. Hmm. Um, in many places, however, uh, people were moved out of 
uh, housing that was substandard on any mm -hmm. reasonable comparison, and that was substituted for housing with services at a much higher level. Although again, the communities were still disrupted. Uh, there was a loss of a lot of history uh, in the process. So there were definitely costs and mistakes were certainly made. Mm. But if you look at the improvement in the lot of, of, of life and the improvement in living standards that have gone along with urbanization, you know, it's a trade-off that China chose to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have two more questions and maybe you can give us a short responses because our time is uh, just about up. Uh, uh, one question comes from our colleague, George Yip, who asks, how should a U.S. company figure out which city in China to set up operations? Okay, that, uh, and again, we should probably have a, a session on, on foreign companies operating in China. Uh, the first thing you do is you look at where the markets are and you do this at three levels. Um, you do that at, you know, what's the, the size of the economy, the level of affluence, therefore purchasing power. But then you also need to look at where the city is located uh, and its accessibility uh, through the transport infrastructure, which is now pretty good. But again, right now, it's still not a one to one. So you have to combine what a company would normally look at, size of market, uh, et cetera, affluence levels. Uh, but you have to overlay uh, the accessibility. The typical foreign company will go Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and then we'll start looking at other, you know, at second tier cities. Uh, well, they may also go to Shenzhen. And then they'll look at Chengdu, because Chengdu is the capital of Sichuan province, 95 million people. Chengdu itself is a top 10 city economy. And that gives you access to uh, Sichuan province. Hmm. Or you'll go to Qingdao up in Shandong, which again is a top 12 uh, economy. But that gives you access to Shandong, uh, Shandong, which I believe has the second highest GDP of any province in China. So it's not that hard. It's basically a bit like the, um, you know, a bit like the uh, champagne uh, glass pyramid, only now at a national level because the different major regions in China do have clear uh, leading cities. So the tendency is to go city, 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 and then go uh, grow organically out into the surrounding cities from you know, first one, then two, then four, then eight, then 12 uh, leading cities. Okay, and for the final uh, question, maybe, I know it's going to be hard to fill, uh, compress the answer into just about a minute or so. What would be the biggest challenges that China is likely to face in its urbanization uh, on the way to 2050? I think that the biggest challenge now is creating the livable, attractive city for people of all levels of income. And what China is doing is it's using these metro systems to redevelop the cities. Because once you have a metro system in place, you can clean out a lot of the old non-historical architecture, which quite frankly is substandard, poor ventilation, poor sanitation, public health, potential hotspots. Um, it can be done, it's the ability to execute that in an orderly process and to continue to have a long time frame uh, in mind uh, in order to do that. Uh, some cities are trying to develop, you know, uh, Wuhan tried to go from no central business districts to six central business districts, which for Wuhan is four too many, mm. right? So it's organizing and being really disciplined uh, in terms of the, the, the physical development, which combines with the economic development, et cetera. And sometimes that means going out and focusing on thinning out and redeveloping and renovating old areas rather than cutting ribbons in nice shiny developments in greenfield areas. Mm. Perfect, Michael, I think, again, you've uh, opened up our vistas to the very important aspect of China's development. 
in this third in our China Insight series. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, just remind the audience that our next uh, topic in this series will be China's 14th five-year plan, a very important subject uh, indeed on April the 14th. I invite all of you to join us uh, for that event. Thank you again, Michael, for taking some questions and giving us a fantastic tour of this topic in China. Uh, thank you all the audience again, and thank you, Michael, once again, and thank you, Magda, for your help with all of the administrative work. We hope to see you again on April 14th. Thank you all. Goodbye and good night. Thank you.